Welcome to the, this course on an introduction to data science. So before we get started, I want to just kind of give you a bit about my background. Um, so my classical training is in molecular biology. Um, I did my graduate work at UC San Diego. I worked at the Salk Institute, and it was a really exciting time in molecular biology. So this was in the early 2000s. Um, big genome sequencing was just starting to kind of take off. Uh, Craig Ventner, when I first started, had just finished sequencing the human genome. Um, people at the Salk Institute, Joe Ecker in particular, was sequencing mRNAs and looking at global gene expression sorts of data, where we could look at all the potential um, proteins that were going to be produced by an organism at a certain time point. And so there was this huge amount of data coming in into biology. And at the time, I was kind of peripherally involved in that. I was working on specific genes and specific protein-protein interactions. Um, but I was right next to all this really exciting stuff going on. And it really started making me think about data science and, and you know, how do you deal with these big data structures? And in the process, you know, I kind of was stuck in that kind of white castle of, of academia and focused on my own work. But it's been influencing me and, and sitting in the back of my mind for years now. And after I finished my graduate work and did a postdoc working on algae biofuels, which turned out to be an economically not viable um, attempt to, to kind of solve our, our fuel problems at the current juncture, I decided to move into computer science and kind of remove that black box of biology and move into these silver boxes of computers. Um, and that transition really has allowed me to kind of dig into to data science and computer science and really think about how to attack those, those big pieces of data. And so the goal of this course isn't really to um, you know, show you all the amazing things that you can do with data science, but really talk about kind of the big picture of data science and what is data science. I think a lot of people um, are kind of unclear as to what data science is. And then from there, kind of give you some basic tools to kind of attack some data science yourself. And we'll talk about why you want to have those basic tools in place um, and kind of where you can go from there. So with that, um, let's go ahead and start off and talk a little bit about data science and what is data science. And then throughout the rest of the, the program, we're going to talk about data organization in our next chapter, data visualization, data analytics, um, how to become a data scientist. And then finally, as I said, we're going to kind of give a little bit of a demo on using Excel. All right, so what is data science? So there are kind of two major pieces of data science. The first one is this idea of just data analysis. And so you know, a lot of jobs that are and companies that are looking for data scientists are really looking for somebody that's, that's an expert in data analysis. So this is somebody that can take data, and with that data, they can, can make these really cool inferences or extrapolate information that's valuable to the company. So that's kind of one side of, of data science. But there's kind of a second side of data science, and that's really the scientific approach to data itself. And this would be what sort of mechanisms or strategies um, are used to, you know, best attack a data set. So data is just data, right? So it doesn't matter if it comes from a biological system or a physics system or, um, you know, from inter internet use or wherever that data comes from. It doesn't really make a difference. It's really about the fact that it is data and it has certain behaviors that one can apply and, and apply scientific methods effectively to it. And so that's kind of the second part of data science. So data analysis is kind of one, one aspect of where it's like, hey, I'm going to use these tools to really create um, a really good predictive model or you know whatever. Or, and I should say, um, there's the second type, which is kind of this more academic structure, which is like, how do I best attack data? So do I use clustering? Do I use a neural net? Do I use a support vector machine to attack this data in the most effective way? And so there's, there's that kind of split in what a data scientist is. And so um, I think that, that generates some of the, the nebulousness of, you know, hey, what is a data scientist? And so it's kind of these both these pieces that have kind of been munged into and collapsed into one, one thing. And so how did data science really kind of get its feet under, the, under itself? So it started off kind of as a, potentially as an evolution of applied statistics, but you could also think of it as an evolution of computer science. So if we look at the scientific method, kind of the general plan with, with the scientific method is you have data, right? And you're looking at that data and you want to understand it, right? Scientists, the goal is of a scientist is to understand how things work, right? So you're going to ask a question about that data. 
So you have this question in mind, and you're going to make a hypothesis as to why that happens. So you have this kind of model, which is this hypothesis of like, hey, the answer to my question is blah, right? So um, then you set up an experiment, then you analyze the results of that experiment, and then you either say, hey, this is a result, like the data so far fit this hypothesis, so I'm going to kind of present that as like, hey, my hypothesis is working. Um, I might have generated some new data that like, allows me to subtly mutate or change my hypothesis. Um, or I might be like, hey, this is a really cool result. Let's talk and share it with the world. Um, but the majority of the time what happens is you get your data back and you're like, oh, that doesn't really fit my hypothesis or it doesn't fit it as well as I would like. And so you end up with this kind of iteration um, and this iterative cycle. So you basically go hypothesis, experiment, analyze, hypothesis, hypothesize again, experiment, analyze, and repeat. And so um, one of the slowest points of that process in some cases is the analysis of that data, right? So you get all this data back, and now you have to do all these analyses to say, hey, does that actually fit my hypothesis? And so you might have, you know, at the time, 10,000 points of data, or even 100,000 points of data. And if you had to do that by hand, or even write your own computer program to do it, um, that, that writing and, and doing it by hand just takes a lot of time. And so computers came in and said, hey, we can, well, the computers didn't say anything, but um, we could use computers to do that analysis. And so that's kind of the first chunk of data science, is doing that analysis. But over time, it started to evolve, where not only do we need to do the analysis, or can we do the analysis, we can also have it do different hypotheses. And so an example of this um, might be, hey, we're going to predict that two events, so let's just call them x and y, um, fit together and correlate with a straight line. And so we, we generate that hypothesis, and we try to draw a whole bunch of lines, you know, mx plus b sort of lines, where there's these straight lines, and we're like, oh, what is, does that fit these data points? And what's the best fit of that data point? Um, but that's great. But you could maybe fit those data better with a polynomial, so some sort of curved line. And every time you change that line shape, you have to change you know, all this analysis, and you're basically running a different hypothesis on that data. You're saying, hey, this line fits best, or this polynomial line fits best, or this logarithmic line fits best. And so each one of those takes a lot of time. And so you as a person would have to come up with all those, those different hypotheses and run that experiment and then do the data analysis, and hopefully the computer would do the data analysis for you. But people realize that there's no reason that you have to come up with that hypothesis each time. You could run a suite of hypotheses, and basically computer science has started to evolve where it's basically doing the hypothesis, the experiment, and then the analysis, kind of that whole chunk. And some of the really cool AI stuff is actually even starting to kind of move out and take, you know, um, and, and really attack the questions that are there. So it's not just doing the hypothesis experiment analysis side of um, kind of the scientific method, we're moving into having those machines actually ask the question um, and look at the data and kind of taking this whole loop. Um, and so that's kind of the future, I think, of, of some pieces of data science and AI. Um, awesome. So what have some of the successes of data science been? So obviously Google, so search engine optimization, um, has been a huge hit um, for a number of companies. And the reason it's a hit is basically these companies are taking in this tremendous amount of data about someone, right? You know, we're generating all this what's called data exhaust as we go through the world. You know, you know what we search on the internet, um, you know, all those, those, that, those information pieces, what ads we look at, et cetera, all get kind of collected by someone. And because those data are collected, you can analyze that data and generate, hey, maybe this person's gonna buy this product in the next year. So maybe we wanna send them a few extra ads in that area. And basically Google said, hey, let's, let's take that data, let's sell that data basically to bring in more ad revenue. Um, and that was kind of their, their basic general model. But basically that was all this kind of, of iteration of, let's make some, um, we have this data, let's make a hypothesis about it, let's experiment on it, let's analyze it and see what kind of best ads we can send to, to 
people that have these particular sets of behaviors. But other things that have been extremely successful, you know, Amazon has basically gone through all of their product catalog and they have an algorithm that goes through it and makes sure that um, the prices don't have any weird price anomalies um, so that they're actually able to make sure that they have a certain margin. Even if it's a sl small loss in some cases, they can minimize that margin. Um, and so they don't have these, every once in a while they'll have these weird price anomalies that they used to. Um, you know, UPS, um, when it kind of did its right turn um, algorithm, so if you haven't heard about this, um, UPS, and I think most, most shipping companies, spend the majority of their money on fuel. And so if you can minimize how much fuel you're using as a driver, um, you can maximize your cost. And so they basically applied a learning algorithm to driving routes to kind of minimize the amount of fuel that a driver is going to be using. And so, um, again, they're kind of using this iterative, iterative attack on um, data. So data science, um, as we kind of mentioned, has solved a bunch of kind of interesting problems, but it's used all over the place. So um, small businesses can benefit from good data analysis and good data scientists. Um, you could have great, great uh, information coming out in genomics. Um, you know, we already talked about search engine optimization. Um, literature, you know, looking at historical literature and looking at kind of what verbiage was being used can be really interesting. So there's all these kind of really kind of, some of them are esoteric, some of them are really, you know, apropos to the times, um, you know, politics, um, all these things that are being attacked from this kind of data rich environment. And so we need all these tools to kind of really expand our knowledge about these different things. And so that's why data science is so exciting right now. Um, so with that said, hopefully you kind of have a general sense of, of what a data scientist is. So, but just to reiterate, so a data scientist is someone who either can think about data and kind of the, their approach to data and how to analyze data in general um, is kind of one kind of the academic side of it. But it's also taking all the tools that that academic side are generating and applying them to different types of data. Um, and being like, okay, so I'm gonna use a support vector machine to figure out how these things cluster together. Um, and then that will lead to different, different outcomes. So how do you become a data scientist? I think there are three major pieces. So the first piece is organizing data. Data come in a whole bunch of different forms, whether it's a spreadsheet or a streaming video. You really need to be able to take that data and put it into some, some format that um, your system can deal with. If your system is just you, that's fine. I mean, you, can, you as a person can, can be a data scientist. Um, the next piece is visualization of data. So being able to kind of look at data and see it yourself, whether that's a visual representation of data or maybe some other type of representation of data, and also being able to present that data in a visual format that somebody that's not as familiar with data um, can understand. I think those are two critical pieces. So visualization is kind of split into two pieces. And the last piece is data analysis. And this is kind of the, the, the fun part of, of data. Um, being a data scientist is like, how do you attack your data such that you understand it better and you can kind of, kind of really dig into it and get, get that really insightful gold nugget that's often hiding in, in the data, um, such that you can be like, oh, that's a really interesting hypothesis, that's a really interesting result that, that comes out from these data. Maybe we should move our company in this direction. So um, those are kind of the three pieces of, of data scientists, of being a data scientist, and that's what we're going to be talking about in the next um, couple of chapters. So, thank you. Welcome back to part two this in, on this introduction to data science. So today what we're going to be talking about is data organization. So one of the biggest pieces of being a data scientist is organizing data. So I have this kind of fake infographic here. 62% of time is spent organizing data. But really, it's just the majority of time. So you're going to get these data from different sources, and you really want to try to understand what they are, but also, data aren't coming in cleanly a lot of times. So, you know, an example is a spreadsheet. So maybe a whole bunch of people at your company have access to a certain spreadsheet, and the way they enter data are different. So maybe some people um, use um, text in a column that should be all numbers, or maybe they leave it blank every once in a while. And so all of these things can affect your ability to analyze that data effectively. And so you have to go through and, and kind of munge that data and clean it up um, to make sure that you can actually use it. And as the data sets get larger and larger, 
the amount of time that you spend doing that and kind of fixing things that are not right <laughs> um, becomes greater and greater. So that's one really big aspect of, of kind of being a data scientist is, is just sitting and, and working with data sets so you can get it into a format that you can actually use. Um, you know, setting up your columns and rows and making sure that you have potentially multiple rows that, that are kind of describing things um, so you can organize it better later on. All those things are, are, are part of this, this cleaning up and organizing data. In addition, not all data types come in this sort of tabular form, right? So data scientists are dealing with live stream video, as I mentioned. Um, and how do you deal with, with this information that's coming in? How do you deal with this audio signal that's coming in? So those data are, are totally different than what you think of, or we generally think of as, as you know, an Excel table. Um, but they're, they're important types of data, and you need to figure out how to, how to deal with them. So again, just, just to kind of reiterate on this point, organizing data is like a huge part of being a data scientist. And it's kind of fun once you kind of get used to it, but it takes a little bit of while, a bit of time to kind of get your hands around data and, and you know really feel comfortable and being fun. Um, but let's just talk about kind of how I break apart organizing data. And I'm going to do this for each of these three pieces of organizing data, visualizing data, and analyzing data. I kind of split it into three different levels um, with some examples. And so. A great track to becoming a data scientist is kind of work through each level by itself, um, but that's not the only track. So, so let's just go ahead and, and start and talking about the kind of the three levels of, of organizing data. So the first one is kind of this level one data, and these are going to be like Excel tables. So, you know, these are things that you'd see in a small business where you're getting, you know, your company has, you know, information about it, um, you know, in this one table in kind of a pretty organized structure. So maybe it's a MySQL table that you're pulling in from MySQL or um, some other database as well. But it's, it's generally quite structured and quite tabular. Um, the second level is going to be the sort of, you know, more complicated data types. So, you know, genomics is the example that we're going to talk about today. Um, but it's not just genomics. It's basically when you're pulling in data from different locations and trying to integrate it. So maybe you are working at a mid-sized company that's dealing with a shipping. And you want to look at shipping over time. And you noticed kind of these weird trends that there were these downtimes in shipping. And so maybe you're, as a data scientist, you're wanting to pull in weather information at the same time. And so your, your Excel table that you're using for your company doesn't have weather information. So you're having to go and get that data from somewhere else and bring it in. Um, and so you're doing these mashups of data. And so kind of level two is, is really being really comfortable mashing up that data and, and bringing it into these, these more complicated formats. And then level three is kind of this next step. Um, and it's not necessarily a step in the level three stuff. It's dealing with data types that are just non-uniform. Um, some of these data types that are just, just things that you aren't used to dealing with and figuring out how to deal with those. And so those are kind of my three levels of being a data scientist um, and, and organizing data. So let's just talk about level one and two, um, or level one first. And then we'll move into level two and then into level three. And throughout this course, once we get into the demos, we're going to be focusing on kind of this level one, maybe a little bit into the level two stuff. Um, I think some of the, the other courses that are out there, so Microsoft has a great um, certificate program that really talks about moving from level one to level three on some of these things. And so if you're wanting to, to explore more after this, this set of courses, um, or you're just like, I love data science, I just want to jump right into that, that's a great place to start. So, cool. All right, so level one data. I think most everybody's seen this sort of data. You know, it's this sort of common tabular format um, where you have information in, in columns and rows. Um, each row generally is one piece, one piece of information about a product or a date or some sort of, of thing. So, um, you know, here's an example of maybe just a, a profit um, chart that you might see in a small company. So. As we kind of go through this, um, I want to point out a few different things. So you'll notice on line five here, um, this data, as we mentioned, um, isn't really clean, right? So we have all these, these numbers that are formatted in dollars, and then we have this random string of 14. And so um, these features of, the, of these, these level one data types are generally, they're, they're pretty humanly readable. So there's not like, you know, a million or two million or a hundred million lines of, of different data. Um, it's something that, that you could read through and scroll through yourself. So maybe there's a hundred thousand of them. You could still do that yourself and, and do it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, 
So humanly readable, usually fairly clean, so you're not having to change a lot of things, maybe a few things that you're going to have to go through and edit. Um, and it's usually coming from a single source. And so, as I said, you know, where you'd see this sort of thing is maybe small businesses, maybe in the biology scene, you'd see them in FDA trials of well-designed experiments, that sort of thing. Um, but having a simple data set doesn't really mean the analysis is automatically simple. So, um, in fact, small data sets can actually be harder to analyze in some ways because you don't understand what's going on in the data. There just aren't enough data points to really get your head around them. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the general sense with, with level one data. So what sort of tools would you want to have as a level one data organization, data scientist? Well, obviously you want to be able to use spreadsheets or you know, deal with tabular, tabular data. Um, there's some great tools for kind of organizing data. So Excel is great, um, Power BI is great. You probably want to understand some basic SQL querying um, and different types of data formats that are tabular in nature, but maybe not in format. So comma separated value files, for example, um, is a really common data type format. So these are formats where basically instead of rows and columns, you have enter um, generating a new row and commas separating each column. Cool. All right, so moving on to level two data. So level two data are data that may not be humanly readable, but are still parsable. Um, here's an example of a gene sequence. So basically just a whole bunch of A's, T's, C's, and G's. And right, if you know, an average one of us looks at this, they're gonna be like, okay, that's great. <laughs> um, but we can't really do anything with that um, in its current format. You know, we could, could do a few things, but just it's not very usable. And so a level two data scientist might be taking this data and applying some different structures to it. So we know that genes um, can be turned into proteins, and there's some rules about doing that, right? And so basically, um, DNA has codons in it, and those codons can get turned into um, proteins through um, transcription and translation. And so we know those rules, we know how to do it, and so this data set might turn into some sort of column and, and row sort of level one data um, in the following manner. So basically, all I did is counted the, the number of um, nucleotides in the, in the sequence and then converted it into a protein, um, found the longest reading frame and said, hey, the protein length is gonna be 566 um, amino acids. So that's just an example of kind of taking multiple pieces of information, bringing them in, and then turning them into something that's a little bit more digestible. And so that's kind of the goal of this, the level two um, aspect of, of data organization. And so um, sometimes it's humanly readable and just, you know, you bring in multiple tables. Um, other times um, you might need some, some domain expertise to kind of really get your hands into that data. Um, and where you're gonna see this sort of data, you know, are genomics, um, larger corporate entities, um, potentially like streaming data that's coming back with really clear formatting, but it's coming fairly quickly. Um, so all those things are kind of this level two data, data structure um, and where you're, where you're really getting and organizing this stuff um, in a really tangible and parsable manner. Cool, so um, again, some tools that you really wanna have kind of down when you're jumping into that level two and moving on to that level two. Um, again, you're going to be using Power BI probably, or you know Tableau, or some of these similar tools. Um, but you're also going to be starting to dive into um, some sort of programming language. So it's really hard um, to look at a million rows of, of data and bring over tables together, um, and then clean that ta that data up without some sort of um, statistical programming um, package. So. Some of the ones that, are, that people are commonly using, Python um, with pandas or Spark, um, R, um, you'll see some Java, and you'll also see some functional programming stuff with Scala. Um, so as you move, again, as you move from this level one to level two, you're gonna kind of move from this you know, really clear, readable data to kind of this abstract, a slightly more abstract level. And so, um, being able to kind of pull things in and understand that you're pulling, how you're pulling them in without really seeing all the data right there. So, cool. So the skills that you want to have, um, you definitely want to be able to match up data. You want some sort of data intuition. Um, so when you look at you know, some of your visualizations, you kind of know how you're going to potentially attack it later. Um, because you can't um, do everything you know, visually because there's just too much information there potentially or it's not humanly readable, you really need to be confident in your ability to 
programmatically clean up that data. So this is kind of data munging. And so you really want to be trusting of your, your skill set and be like, oh, you know, everywhere there's a zero, I'm going to convert that to um, a 42 because it makes sense to do that for this particular data set. Um, maybe we're trying to figure out um, what the meaning of the world is or something. Um, so those are kind of the skills that you want to have. Um, and again, although I kind of want to emphasize this point of, of data scientists being kind of data agnostic, like um, you can bring in information from wherever and apply these really standardized um, best models and best attack methods to attack that, meta, that data. Um, in some instances, data area or subject area knowledge is, is actually advantageous. So, um, so it's not something to be ignored, but um, I do like this idea of even if it's if it's just a theoretical idea of, of data scientists being kind of data type or data source agnostic. Um, so, cool. So let's move on to level three data organization. So I'm not going to talk too much about this, but level three data organization is really when you're starting to get and deal with non-uniform data. So, you know, we talked about this idea of data exhaust um, in our first chapter. So this idea that as we move through the world, um, we're doing all these things that are being picked up um, by our behavior. So our searches, um, maybe traffic cameras, you know, maybe if we were using a smart fridge, all these things are, are generating data. Um, and there's so much data that's coming through that one of the strategies that people have used is like, we're just going to collect this stuff. We don't care how we collect it, how organized we are about collecting it. Um, we're just going to grab it. So by grabbing it and, and just having it there for us, um, we need to, some way to, to, to deal with that. And you know, figure out how to, to or restructure that data from this kind of unstructured format and bring it into something that we can actually use is, is a big part of this level three data organization. Um, in addition, you're going to be dealing with things that are just huge amounts of data, um, where you're basically getting so much information in that maybe your machine can't deal with all that data at one point, so you're going to have to use distributed systems, or that data is coming in so quickly and you want to get it back out in some sort of digested format very quickly as well. So real-time integration, where you're trying to really optimize um, how you're organizing that data and how you're spitting it back into different, different locations. And so that's kind of the, the, the level three data set that, or skill set that I, I think you know, you'd really want to have down if you want to be a level three data organization um, part piece of the data scientist um, collection. So what kind of tools would you want for being level three? So again, now we're moving into to specifically into programming. Um, so you're going to be using Python, you're going to be using R, Scala, um, and you're really going to be wanting to know how to deal with distributed systems. So Hadoop or Pig or Hive are some of these, these just data um, databases that can um, really are set up to deal with, with big data sets. Um, and, and once you kind of have those down and you, you're able to take in information kind of from anywhere and bring it in, you know, you're, you should feel com confident that you're kind of this level three um, data organization piece. And one of the things I want to kind of just bring up one more time is, you know, a data scientist doesn't have to be level three on every single thing. So somebody that's level three on data organization is extremely valuable because you might have a level three data analyst out there who's just going to take that data once you've generated it and just just make some amazing conclusions off of it. And so, you know, science in general has has progressed from this idea of, you know, you're an individual that can do everything to uh, this kind of collaborative environment. And data organization or data scientists are no exception to that. You know, there's there's a bunch of really specialized skill sets, um, and you could be great at all of them. Or you could work as a team and, and be just phenomenal at one of them and let your other team members um, kind of take over those other, other roles for you. So, so don't be afraid to, like, hey, I love doing this one aspect of data science um, and think that that's not valuable because it is. All right. So next we're going to be talking about data visualization. Welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about part three, data visualization. So. Remember, there's kind of these three pieces of, of becoming a data scientist that you really should, should be working towards mastery in. So data organization, visualization, and data analysis. Um, 
So just like with data organization and what's coming up in data analysis, we're dividing data visualization up into kind of three levels. So the first level is kind of the, the typical stuff that you're going to be seeing, again, using Excel, Power BI, where you're generating these sort of really kind of classical um, data presentations. So, you know, you're talking about trending and, and um, you know, histograms and, and trend lines and kind of this, this level that's, um, you know, some pretty basic statistics plus, you know, nice visual graphics that, you know, most everybody can, can understand and has seen before. Um, ideally, with all of these final types of presentations, um, the thing about them is you can make the most amazing graphic, but if it's somebody, something that somebody can't understand, it's really not very useful. And so um, just keep that in mind. So there's some really beautiful things that you can do with um, data visualization, and sometimes it, it um, does not make the science clear. <laughs> so even though um, you really want kind of this artistic background with your, your data presentation, um, make sure that it's, that it's clearly illustrating what you needed to illustrate for your audience um, for the presentation side. So let's jump into level one, um, data science, or data visualization, and then um, kind of talk about what that means. And then we'll move into kind of the level two and the level three stuff. And data visualization and data analysis kind of have this interesting jump that we'll talk about later um, in their level three stuff. And um, just to kind of give you a primer to, that, to what we'll talk about, um, there's this trend in, in data science to move away from kind of this classical statistics and kind of model-based approach to this machine learning approach. And both level two or level three stuff in um, visualization as well as in um, analysis, kind of we'll talk about, about that a little bit more um, and kind of why that trend's occurring and what it means. So, cool. So, um, again, visualization, kind of there's two pieces of visualization. First is you understanding the data, and then the second piece is under explaining results to other people. Um, and so that's kind of why we, in the, the hierarchy of events, we have organize the data and then visualize, visualize the data and then analyze the data because you really want to understand what you're trying to do with your data um, prior to running an analysis on your data. Um, so getting that data intuition is really key and a really easy way to get initial data um, kind of um, understanding is to, to visualize it. So. So here's an example of, of, of visualization. So maybe you have a bunch of different data points um, and they're kind of, you know, they're just thousands of data points and you don't know what they are. So um, there's some, some kind of trends in data science that you want to be able to predict behaviors based on some sort of, of dynamic of the data. And so a very common one that you hear about is like a normal distribution. And these are these nice bell-shaped curves that a lot of you have seen. Um, so Gaussian distributions and that sort of thing. But with just looking at a data set, you have no idea if it's going to be fitting a Gaussian curve or it might look like something like this where you have these kind of these two separate humps. Um, and so it, so you want to be able to see that um, in some manner. So whether or not you you can, or one of those people can just visualize it yourself, which is a very, very, very small percentage of us. But most of us need some sort of representation. So um, the histogram is a super common one. Um, basically, it says, how many times did a certain event occur? So you know, how many um, students got A's, B's, C's, or D's are kind of maybe some different bins that you might want to put something in. And actually, in education, that's a very common thing is to see these bimodal distributions where you have kind of one peak at one location, you know, kind of the A, B range, and another peak down at the D, F range, at least in, like, the high school level. Um, and there's a bunch of different reasons for that, but a lot of it's just student engagement and things that are going on in students' lives. Um, so you get these, these interesting distributions. Um, so you want to be able to see that. And so um, before you analyze your data, because you can't do all the same things if the data are not normally distributed, you can't run t-tests very easily, um, you can't do some of the things where you're saying, hey, you know, this is three standard deviations away from um, the mean, so it's, it's, it's something that's probable to happen or not to happen. Um, you know, if you're three standard deviations away from the mean, it's, you know, 99% chance that it's not related to that mean um, or, or is, is a pretty far outlier. So, um, so understanding that is, is super important and kind of knowing what your data look like and knowing what sort of tools you can use um, are, are absolutely critical. So the second piece is the, the more classical presentation sort of thing. So an example, you know, 
there's some great tools out there right now. So, you know, Excel has, has continues to, to make amazing changes where you can basically say, hey, let's make a chart of X, Y, or Z. And it'll just do it for you and be like, okay, so this is a beautiful chart. Um, you know, I just pulled up Excel's, um, you know, chart maker and just like, this is just a screenshot of like the, the, um, the tutorial that they have on the, the beginning of it. So you can just do this stuff and it'll make these amazing, amazing charts. And, you know, we look at them and, and we can kind of understand what they're doing, but one thing I really want to caution people against as you become a data scientist is not to just blindly trust these tools to, and you really want to understand what these tools are doing behind the scenes so that you can kind of understand and explain to somebody when you say, hey, I'm presenting this data, um, you know, maybe you're trying to make some sort of decision for your company. You don't want to just be like, hey, this tool just spat out this really nice graphic for me and, and um, you know, here it is. <laughs> um, you want to be able to explain explain what's going on behind there, and that'll allow you to kind of really manipulate that data. Um, so, you know, as I said, there's some great tools for this kind of level one stuff. So, you know, the ones that we'll be talking about with, through this course are Power BI and Excel. You know, Tableau has some great things. Um, you know, even some of the programming languages, Spark, or sorry, um, Python has a, and and R both have some great ways to visualize data. Um, so, you know. Use those. Those are some of the tools that you're going to be wanting to, to understand and be able to pretty feel pretty comfortable with. But I really want to reemphasize this warning. You know, before you go and present any type of data, you know, you really want to understand those tools that you're doing and and use to get those 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 data into presentable form. Because there's nothing worse than going into presentation and grilling the presenter about their data because you see some sort of trend in there and them being like, oh, I don't really understand how I got this information, right? Like, you don't want to be that person as the presenter. Like, understand what's, what's going on, so. Um, but as, as a level one person, you know, you really, you know, taking this idea and like looking at your data and starting to get that data intuition, um, so like doing the pre-visualization and then understanding what you're doing as, as kind of your final presentation is, is absolutely critical. So level two, in level two, you know, you're gonna be taking data types that are a little bit different. Um, so here's an example of just a, some node clustering. So basically this idea would be something like Facebook, right? So in Facebook, you know, you have a bunch of friends and maybe, um, you know, those friends have a certain amount of messages that they send back and forth. So they're gonna be closely clustered to you because you're, you're getting lots of messages from them. But there's a few friends out there that you have that maybe are further away. You maybe only send a message to once a month or once a year. Um, they're still connected to you, but they have a, a lower weight in this particular instance. Um, and so you can start generating these graphics that kind of represent that. And again, you wanna be able to explain, you know, what these complicated relationships are in a way that you know, with a with a short explanation or a, a short um, sort of interaction with your your end user, or um, you know, even a written description for that that graphic, they can understand too what you're trying to get across. And so, the level two stuff is going to be taking data that are that are maybe not that kind of classical, automatically generated sort of formats from um, some of these other tools, but maybe some more complicated structures where you're being like, okay, I want to visualize this, uh, maybe this three dimensional or four dimensional space such that somebody else can understand it. And so um, it's kind of the more on the, on the analytical side of things. So you can really make some amazing graphics from, you know, if you're kind of in that level two space. Um, and these graphics are gonna be kind of these design, you know, decision just guiding graphics. So graphics that are gonna be like, you know, they really take the user, suck them in, and really give them, you know, a good grip on some data that they might not have had a, had a understanding of beforehand. Um, this includes things like interactive designs, and of course, you're gonna still wanna know how to apply core analytical methods to these data. So, um, so that's kind of the level two, two structure. Um, again, Power BI and Excel do some of these things for you, but at this point, you're gonna be moving into doing stuff with Python or D3JS or R. Um, and I think in the future, you know, it's gonna be really interesting because these data sets are getting more complicated and you're getting these multi-dimensional data sets. And what I mean by multi-dimensional is these are data that have a whole bunch of different types of columns. So every column in a data set you can think of as a dimension that you're going to look at that you could could investigate, right? You could compare, um, you know, seat number in a car to car weight, right? Those are two dimensions that you could graph on an X and a Y. And so, um, so anything that you can describe as an X and a Y, um, you can consider a dimension. And so how do you visualize that when you have, you know, 500 things about a car? Um, 
in a way that kind of allows somebody to explore that information. So um, virtual reality, I think, is going to be an interesting tool that people are going to start to use where you can kind of walk into your data and start to, to manipulate it. Um, but we'll see. I mean, that's just my speculation. But I think that still fits into this kind of level two structure. So, um, and as I mentioned before, level three is kind of going to be a jump. And so, um, right now we're kind of dealing with kind of these classical columnar sorts of data where you're dealing with, with data sets that, you know, you can kind of make sense of. Um, level three of visualization is going to be kind of this, this ability to present architectures of, you know, experimental designs and how you're going to analyze the data. Because, as I said, um, data science is, is also bringing this huge component from machine learning. And machine learning, you know, it's not always about, um, you know, kind of being able to visualize that data from the top down because you're going to let, let the, the machine do a bunch of these experiments and hypotheses. And so you want to be able to tell your end user basically how are you setting up those, those parameters for the machine to learn with? And so um, my view of, of level three data is basically being able to explain clearly what sort of manipulations you're going to let the computer do um, such that it can analyze the data for you. Because then you can have a discussion about what those results are. So if you don't have a clear understanding of how you set up your system, and they don't have a clear understanding of how you set up, set up your system, those results really aren't that meaningful because you don't know how to communicate about them. Because you're like, well, yeah, it predicted what we expected to predict, and it's been really good. It has like an 85% or 95% you know, accuracy rate. But I don't know how it got there, right? So again, you don't want to be that person. You don't want to be like, hey, uh, this is working really well, but I have no idea how it works. <laughs> um, so an example of this would be maybe talking about what the neural net net would be that you're using. So um, neural nets are kind of a, a structure for allowing um, computers to make decisions. So in these input neuron, neurons, per, pretend that we're visualizing something. Per, let's say we're visualizing a spider. And so input neuron, that top one on the top left, might be the color black. Is it black? And so it's going to be, OK, so it's either black or not. So that's going to be either on or off. And then the next thing is, is it shiny? And that's going to be on or off. And the next thing might be, does it have eight legs? And that's going to be on or off. And the next thing is, it, are you, is it touching you? That's going to be on or off. And so those might be some of the inputs that are coming in. And then depending on what um, inputs are actually firing, those are going to hit these integration neurons and kind of make decisions based on that. So um, you know, maybe it's black and shiny and has a red, red um, piece on it, or a red hourglass on it, but it's not on you. And so you know, that might feed into the integration neurons two and four. Um, and those then send out information to these output neurons. Maybe you leave it alone or you run away screaming. So depending on what it is, right? And so you kind of want to be able to describe this, this how this decision-making process is going to occur. And then you're going to take a data set or data sample potentially and apply it and say, hey, you know, every time somebody saw a Black Widow, they ran away screaming. Let's let them, the machine figure out how to, how to figure that out. So that's kind of where I kind of see level three visualization. Like the data that comes back after you've machine learned something could certainly be in a format that you'd apply level two and level one techniques to, where you're basically saying, hey, these are the results. But to really have a conversation about those results, I think you really need to be able to, to clearly visualize and make visual graphics that understand and explain to your user and to yourself how your system's set up. And so um, again, you know, because the majority of us have some visual learning component, um, I think this is an absolutely critical skill to have um, to kind of be that, that next level of, of, of visualization core member of, of a data scientist team. So, you know, kind of the, the tools that you have for level three um, data, you know, you want to be able to, to present things all the ways that you could do in level two, but you also really want to be able to present machine architectures and so, um, and machine learning architectures. So that's kind of where I see level three. So that completes our data visualization chapter. And next we're going to talk about data analysis. And in that chapter, we'll talk about just how to deal with all these different pieces of data that we're getting in. Um, we'll move on to kind of my view of how to become a data scientist um, and some of the paths that you can take to, to becoming a data scientist and kind of reiterate kind of all the pieces that we've talked about today. And then lastly, we'll just kind of take some of this level one skill sets that we've been talking about and just you know, apply it to an Excel um, or apply it in Excel um, using a CSV file. So I'm really excited to have you here and um, 
hopefully you'll stick with us for the rest of the, this uh, program. Thanks. All right, welcome back to the fourth part of our course on data science. So today we're gonna to just talk about data analysis. Just like the previous three chapters, or two chapters, we're gonna break this up into three levels. The first level is gonna be kind of just the, the basic um, inferential statistics, kind of what you're gonna to apply to um, a lot of data types where you're, you're taking all those tools that you know statisticians have really developed over the last 200 years and just applying them to your data. Um, the second level is going to be kind of taking some of those those statistical level skills and um, applying you know computation to them and kind of using some of these machine learning techniques. Um, and then the third level is is really attacking machine learning um, in a really advanced sort of way. And so. We're just going to kind of talk briefly about these things, um, and you know, as you jump into more and more data science and, and start learning for yourselves, you'll you'll really talk about the level two and level three stuff. And application of these things is really a great way to learn it. Um, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time talking about those things, but I am going to talk about some of the the trends in data science, um, and then just kind of give an example of kind of the level one one stuff as well. And we'll dive more into that when we do our Excel demo. All right, so level one stuff. A lot of the level one data and becoming a data scientist is kind of understanding these really um, pervasive tools and skills that, that we have in, in have been developed for data science so um, and stat, statistics. So one thing that you'll see a lot of times is this, this bell-shaped curve, this Gaussian curve, and what we call it in um, data science is a normal curve. And it has a few number, a number of rules that, that describe its behavior. Um, and understanding what those rules are is really important. And so, and also understanding when you can use those, those tools that have been applied to this Gaussian curve um, and when you can't apply it. So one thing about data and one of the things that we learned about data visualization is that we really understand, need to understand what our data look like before we can actually apply these statistical tools. And so if your data, after you draw a histogram, fits some sort of model that looks like this, then you can probably apply a lot of the, the kind of classical statistical tools. Once you start to deviate from these shapes, there are other distributions that you can apply different tools to, so Poisson distributions and other types of distributions. And you should start to, be under, start to understand some of those things as well as kind of this level one um, data scientist um, level. So you can, can really dig into the data and kind of apply um, meaningful analyses on it. Um, so the tools that you kind of want to, want to be familiar with, you really want to be pretty confident you know, um, using Excel, for example, and if you look at their data analysis toolkit, um, you should understand what those processes are doing. So that's kind of the, the level one um, data analysis. Level two, you're really jumping into, you know, more of the computer science side of things, where you're going to have to to be bringing things in and applying maybe machine learning techniques, or again, you might be dealing with big data, um, and so you're going to not be able to deal with it as easily in a spreadsheet. We're going to have to apply some sort of um, data frame from either R or Python or, um, and really, really figure out and deal with data from a, a code base level. And so, um, again, you can do a lot of the things that you can do in Excel or Power BI using code. Um, you can figure out the mean, the median, um, you know, generate histograms and all those things. But in addition, you're going to start applying some of these machine learning techniques. Um, and the reason that you're going to be doing that is because machine learning um, has some advantages over kind of our classical skill sets. And so, you know, for multi-dimensional spaces, especially large dimensional spaces, um, some of the, the same structures that you're going to use for like trend lines and, and best fit curves um, are just faster to machine learning, um, surprisingly. So it's a great, great um, kind of synthesis of kind of those, those statistical skills that you kind of understand and, and learn to apply at that level one level, but then start to apply it through code. Um, and then extend that a little bit with machine learning. So one of the things about, about data science is um, it's really making this interesting transition at this point um, where some of the algorithms that people are generating for, for machine learning and some of these neural nets are so much better at predicting things that people just apply them and say, hey, you know, these are going to be some fantastic results. And so um, level three is really kind of being able to apply things like Microsoft Cognitive Tool Toolkit or TensorFlow um, and attack problems, not just from, hey, 
you know, somebody wrote this algorithm that's really good at recognizing handwriting. I'm just going to apply it. But being able to attack and write um, some of your own code that's, that's being able to use these tools that, um, you know, take advantage of your graphics processor that can basically spit out a bunch of different, different hypotheses at once and, and um, then analyze those hypotheses very quickly. Um, and so you're really going to be digging into um, the computer science side of, of you know, data analysis. So the, the one that's really, the skill that's really taken kind of hold in the last couple of years is, is neural networks. Um, and so I think that's probably um, right now kind of the level three skill set. But data science is evolving very quickly. So there may be some new data structure that some data scientist comes up with from kind of that, that white castle of, of data science where it's really figuring out how to deal with data best um, rather than the application side. And they may come up with some other tool um, that works better. But your goal as a level three data scientist is be able to, to either build your own tools or if you're um, just applying those tools, really understand what those tools are that somebody else built. And so both of those are, are really valuable skills for the level three data scientist. And so um, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to use Microsoft Cognitive Service. You want to be, use, be able to use TensorFlow and Keras. Um, you want to be able to use Torch. Um, at that level and, and really understand what you're doing. Um, so um, data analysis is a really fun part of, of data science. I, for me, data visualization and data analysis are, well, actually all three, three pieces are fun, but, but it's really fun to just, you know, finally get your data. You've, you've spent all this time um, organizing your data. Um, you kind of have a sense of, of how that data look in kind of their, their core pieces after visualizing it, making that, and then you're now like finally getting able to, to jump in and see the results. And so, um, and that's what makes data, data analysis so fun is, you know, you're finally, you know, all your hard work from before is finally paying off and you're like, okay, I'm gonna actually do stuff. Um, and it's a small piece of, of, you know, the data science life cycle, um, but it's, it's, it's really a fun, fun place to be, so. Um, so that's about it for, for data analysis. Um, hopefully as we jump into the Excel, you'll kind of see some of these level one applications, again, from um, data organization to data visualization and a little bit of data analysis um, kind of come together. So, thank you so much. Welcome back to the last part of our data science course before we do our demo. So this piece is gonna be just about becoming a data scientist. Hopefully at this point you're like, oh, that sounds like it's a pretty cool field to be in. And I absolutely agree. So one of the cool things about data science, even though it's been a growing field for the last few years, um, it's still a small enough field that it feels like a community. And you can really become part of that community. It's very welcoming. Um, people are out there, you know, trying to figure out best ways to deal with data and, you know, looking for new information, right? I mean, everybody in this field is, is interested in data. And more data points in general um, are better. And so you can be one of those data points helping out the community. And so it's a great, great place to be, great time to do it. So what is the path to becoming a data scientist? So there's kind of this classical path. It's like, okay, so we're going to learn statistics. We're going to get really good at statistics, um, you know, become professional statisticians. Then we're going to take some computer programming and apply some computer programming to that. We're going to then jump into machine learning. And then we're going to practice. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really easy path to follow. But I'm not sure it's the best best path to follow. Um, you know, I think there's, there's this really interesting thing that I've seen as an educator um, that when you jump into something and kind of follow this classical path and like take course after course after course, you, you depending on how good of a student you are, um, you definitely learn this stuff, but you don't have any application to it. And so my view of becoming a data scientist is as follows if you're, if you're totally new to the field. Definitely you want to, you want to learn these core pieces. So you want to learn some statistics. You want to learn some computer programming. But you don't have to be masters at them. What you want to do is you want to find some data to love and explore. So you want to kind of understand these core basics. You know, kind of understand level one stuff. Maybe even dabble in some of the level three machine learning stuff um, and neural nets and whatnot. But then go and say, I'm going to attack this data set. And attack it, work with a community. Um, you know, you can easily go out there and, and you know, talk to colleagues, send out stuff on Stack Overflow, talk about um, you know, what you're trying to do, go to places like Kaggle, 
um, and enter competitions and join the community and say, I'm attacking this thing in way X, Y, or Z. I'm using k-means clustering. I'm using support vector machines, trying to do this thing. You know, I don't understand this piece of it or, you know, be open to that learning. Um, and I think that's a really good way to kind of really accelerate your learning. And then once you kind of have that, that you know, advanced core of knowledge, then go back and, and start taking the classes that you really want to take. So my, my view of it is, you know, and learning in general, I think, you know, you can learn so much more if you're passionate about it than you do if you're just kind of going through the motions. And so don't just go through the motions. Don't just take class after class after class if you don't really love it. Um, and one way to, to love it is find a, some, something to do with it right away. Um, and so m my advice to you is, you know, as I said, learn the basics, find some data, and just, just go for it. Um, but if you like the more, ac more academic structure, um, you know, there are a number of programs out there. You know, I, again, I'd you know, recommend um, you know, the, the Microsoft Virtual Academy um, course that's specifically on data science. But there's you know, wonderful YouTube videos out there about all sorts of things from machine learning to statistics that you can go through. Um, so if you wanted to look at some data sets, you know, UCI, um, the University of California, Irvine, has some great data sets. Check out their stuff. And that's what we're going to be dealing with when we do our demo on Excel. Um, and with that, I think I just want to go through a few takeaways. So you know, data science is really a scientific process. Um, you know, we're, we're really applying um, the scientific method to, to things. You know, we're, we're taking data. We're asking questions about that data. We're making hypotheses about that data running experience, we're analyzing it, we're getting results out of that data. Um, and there's kind of the, as I said, the kind of the, the white tower side of things and the applied side of things, but both of them um, really take an analytical approach to how we're approaching our data. Um, so hopefully you kind of have a general sense of what data science is um, after this course. Um, then I think the next kind of step is, you know, you really want to start gaining data entry. Um, and so, you know, figuring out what does a Gaussian curve actually mean? Um, what is a t-test? You know, all these things I think are really kind of the, the next step. Um, then, you know, one thing I think a lot of us tend to do when we're learning something new is we try to take everything at once. Um, and it's good to kind of get that big, big overview, but really dive in on a piece and learn incrementally. So, so take a piece and like, you know, spend an hour you know, really sitting down and just like, I'm going to learn, you know, all I can about, you know, coefficient of determination. Um, and just stay focused on it. So, um, so that's, that's another, another piece that I want you to take away from this. And the last piece is, you know, to stay, keep that focus and keep that drive, you know, you really need to be passionate about, about what you're trying to learn. And so um, if you don't have that passion, I think it's really hard to learn, even if you're like, oh, you know, I really want to do these amazing things as a data scientist because they have great jobs. That's not really the right way to, to become a data scientist. It's, I really want to deal with this data because it's, it's, it's something that I'm excited about um, rather than like the, the end point of getting a great job or whatever. So um, with that, um, I think what we're going to move on to is a demo. Um, just trying to talk about some of the level, tool, level one tools that you can do in Excel. Um, again, this is a piece that some of you may know already. Um, if you do, you know, it's okay to, to, to move on and, and, you know, jump in and start learning about data science on your own. Um, if you're at the point where you kind of just want to see how um, somebody might attack it, um, I think this next chapter will be pretty fun to watch. So, thanks again. Excellent. So, welcome back to the last part of our introduction to data science. So, today all we're going to do is just talk a little bit about using Excel. Um, Excel is an excellent tool to kind of get, you know, your hands on a piece of data. Um, and data set, and it's also a very commonly used tool um, throughout the business world. So, you know, I think there's going to be this interesting transition from using Excel to Power BI, which is kind of going to be the, the discussion of our next um, topic. But Excel and, and Power BI are, are kind of synergizing, where you're getting a lot of tools that are being developed for web, web applications and, and pulling information from the cloud, actually pulling into Excel. Um, great. So, what we're going to do in this um, Demos, we're basically going to build ourselves a histogram, talk a little bit more about um, what a histogram is. We're going to create a scatter plot, um, and then we're going to make, deal with the t-test. Um, so hopefully it'll be relatively painless. 
Um, and it should be should be fun. All right. So the data set that we're going to get is going to be a data set that I just randomly grabbed from um, the UCI machine learning repository. And I know I mentioned cars multiple times in, in the earlier videos. I'm actually not a car person, so I don't really know too much about cars. But that's what the data set's going to be on. Um, and just because just I wanted to kind of talk about this data being kind of agnostic, um, so data science being data type agnostic. And so pretty much any tool that you want to apply at this level one stuff, you just kind of apply it to whatever data set you're looking at and see what, what comes out to see how you want to analyze it. So that's going to be our approach. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm just going to go ahead and start up Excel. And um, as it starts up, I'm just going to create ourselves a blank workspace. All right, great. So there's a blank workspace. I'll full screen it. And there's a bunch of different things that you can do. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go up to this data piece up here, click on that, and I'm going to go over, and there's a bunch of different ways you can import data. So obviously, we could just type in our data you know, if we wanted to, just like you normally would. Like, um, Let me just make this a little bit bigger so we can all see it. All right, so we pull up our Excel spreadsheet here. And um, obviously, we could just enter information like we normally would. So we could just be typing in something like ID, and then we'd say one, and name, um, platypus, I don't know. So um, we might be, be talking about different, different pieces, but a lot of data is already out there. And so as a data scientist, it's not really our job to, to um, set up the, the data structure. Um, often we'll have the data structure already in place and we want, to, we want to be the ones that are manipulating it and organizing it afterwards. So to do that, there's a bunch of different ways to import data. Um, and so when you, if you click on the data tab, you can say you know, from text or from HTML or from FileMaker or from a database query. Um, we're going to go from from text. And I already downloaded the data set and stuck it into a CSV file. So um, here it is. It's called car data CSV. And I'm just going to say get data. Now, we talked about CSV files, and CSV files are just these comma-separated value files. And so if we look at it, it's really kind of an ugly-looking um, file. So it's basically columns that are designated by commas. And so um, you might have this thing that says delimited, and that's basically how they're spaced apart. And so if you just hit next after this, great. And it says, how are they split apart? And so you'll see in the, the field, um, as you're going through this, what the data looks like after it's been parsed. So if we leave it as just tab, it looks still pretty ugly. But seeing how it's a comma-separated value, so perhaps our delimiter is a comma. So if we click on comma, we'll notice that it pops out and starts to look more, more like a table. And so um, that's pretty much what we want our data to look like. So let's just go ahead and hit finish. And it'll ask us where do we want to put it. So let's put it into. Um, starting from A and starting from actually 2, because we're going to give this a bunch of titles. Cool. And so our data just got pulled in. Fantastic. So now we're sitting and we have a bunch of different data from 1985 car automobiles. And so what I would recommend if you want um, to kind of work along with this demo is go ahead and get that data set from, um, from UCI, pull it in, and just follow along. So you, know, you can always pause the video. You can always stop it. Um, and kind of make sure that you're at where we are and then work, work with it. Because kind of seeing somebody do it um, is useful, but doing it yourself is much, much, much more useful. So, all right. So now we've got this, but we also have some information about the text file that we're using. So everything from where it came from originally, um, how to cite it, <clears throat> and information about what the different columns are. And so we're going to use that information about what the different columns are and just fill that in so that we have a table that kind of is, is much more humanly readable. And so again, we're just generating this level one data that we've talked about. So we want this kind of humanly readable um, sort of data set that you know, we can all kind of deal with and, and actually make sense of. So I'm um, just going to grab that set of, actually, I'm just going to type it all in. Um, so it's going to take me a few minutes. So um, feel free to speed up the, the um, the demo, or um, if it's going too fast for you still, 
you know, pause the demo and just enter it in yourself if you're working through it. So let me just show you how I'm going to do that. So I'm just going to basically split my screen um, and so that I have both, both pieces of information. Um, now I can just kind of see what I'm doing while I'm doing it. All right, so first one, um, symboling, and we're just going to go all the way through price. Great. So hopefully everybody has all that entered um, so that they're relatively happy with the data. And what we're going to do next is we're just going to organize that data so it's a little bit more, um, I don't know, just, just better. <laughs> we're just going to create it into a table. Um, so we're just going to select all the data and basically just say, hey, why don't we just insert this thing? I just close this down. Sorry. So we've got everything, all the information from our text file. So let's close that. And if you just click on insert and hit table, it'll reformat that and ask you where you want your table from. All right. So A1, perfect. Z1 or Z2 without 206, great. And my table does have headers, so you just hit OK. Yes, and ah, much better. So now we have something that's a little bit more readable. And one of the cool things about converting something to a table using Excel is that it's now sortable. And so, for example, if we wanted to sort something by the number of doors, we could go and get all of the two-door elements. So we'd say something like two and enter. And hope, so notice the number of doors now is filtered going by two um, all the way down. Then it goes to four after that. Great. So um, the tables just give you a little bit more access to, to being able to do things with your data. All right. So as we mentioned before, <clears throat> one of the really critical pieces of dealing with um, data in, in a kind of getting an understanding of data is dealing with the histogram and kind of looking at you know, just histograms in general um, to kind of get a feel for, for how our data are arranged. All right, so now we have all of our data um, with nice columns and we have a nice table. So at this point, let's go ahead and build a histogram. So why don't we take this bore and use that and see what it looks like. So as I mentioned, I don't really know too much about vehicles. So um, we're just going to choose one and see what that data looks like. So First thing we want to do, because this is kind of this level one data where it's kind of humanly readable, we're just going to scroll through this data and look at, you know, kind of the range of data that are in BOR so that we can generate these different bins so we can kind of parse that data and, and organize it in a way that makes sense. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at it. Um, it looks like we have a range that's going to be between um, 3 or 2.5 maybe and looks like about four. And so we're just going to go by um, intervals of um, a tenth and create some bins. So all you got to do is go over and create another column. I'm just going to label this column bins. And we'll start off at 3.5. Um, let me just make sure that's a good, good range. Uh, 3.4, 3.1. So actually, it looks like we can go all the way down to 2.5. So let's just go ahead and start at 2.5 and just work our way down. 2.5. And obviously, we could just do this, um, you know, just write a quick little script to do that. Um, but I'm just going to do it manually because I'm um, going to do it that way. Great. So now we enter our bins. 
and um, we have our range of bins. And all we're going to do is basically ask for Excel to basically organize this, these data into bins in between. So one bin will be 2.5 to 2.6, the next bin will be 2.6 to 2.7, and it will just count how many elements in our um, bore column fit into those criteria. And it will generate us, ourselves a, a nice little graph. All right, so how do we do that? Well, we go over to Data Solver, and we say, go to Histogram. Great. So click on Histogram. Perfect. And we ask what columns we want to do it with. All right, so we've got AB, and we want our bins from all of AB. So bin range. Great. Let's click on AB. And then our bore. Our bore is going to be at column S. So we just click on that. Great. And let's just hit OK. See what happens. Oh, no. Histogram input range contains non-numeric data. All right, so something's going wrong. So somewhere in our data set, we have data that are not accurate, so or not, not valuable to us. So let's cancel that and go ahead and look through our data. So if we look at our bore, bore column, cruising along, cruising along, oh, that looks good, looks good, looks good. Oh, no, there's some weird question marks here. So some of the automobile manufacturers, when this data set were made, didn't publish their bore. Um, so what do we want to do with these data? Well, we need to, to either get rid of them in some way or put them, give them some sort of value that we can kind of deal with. So our bins range from 2.5 to 4. And so if we put these data outside of the bin range um, but make them numerical, so Excel at that point will know what to do with them. They'll know that it'll look at them and be like, Are, do you go into a bin? No. But at least I can read you rather than being trying to read a question mark. All right. So let's make sure that there aren't any more in there. And we're just going to rerun our histogram. Great. So that analysis, histogram. And just to make sure that there are no possible chances that we're catching the title, we're just going to start from S2. That's going to be starting from there. And we're going to go all the way down to S206. And same with AB. So we're going to go from AB2. And then we're going to go all the way down to AB19. So let's go ahead and make ourselves a um, chart style output. And there's a couple of other types of, of histograms that one can look at, Pareto's and cumulative percentages. Um, feel free to explore these on your own. Um, so basically, these are some summated histograms and ways to look at data as they kind of rise over time um, or over whatever type of input you have on your x value, um, so your bins. And so basically, you're going to end up with a percentage as they increase. So um, but we're not going to worry about those for now. So let's go ahead and hit new chart and see what we get. All right, cool. So there's our nice little histogram. And um, it doesn't look particularly abnormal, but it doesn't look like a normal curve either. So there's kind of these, you know, these definite outliers down at this low range, um, some outliers at this high range. And there is a sort of a sloping peak, but I wouldn't consider this necessarily a normal distribution. Um, there are enough data points in here, so 200 data points, that um, you should be able to start to see some sort of tendency towards the mean if you have a normal distribution. And this is one of the reasons that when we mentioned kind of low or um, kind of level one data that analysis can be challenging. If you only have a few data points, maybe you have 30 data points, um, you may not have enough data to actually determine whether or not you have any normality between or generate a normal curve in your data um, when you look at it. But with 200 data points, you should start to see something that looks, starts to look normal if, if it is actually normal. And this, um, just my data intuition says this is probably not normal. And we kind of talked about some of those reasons why um, before. So, you know, you basically have these, these different pressures. And in terms of manufacturing, um, you know, vehicles are limited by how big they can be and how much compartment space there are um, for the engine. And um, so you, you kind of limit it as to how you can generate. Um, and what bore sizes you can generate. Um, in addition, you know, you're, you're going to be conver having conversation with other, ma other manufacturers as, you know, who's, who's generating piping for your, your system. Because you're probably, as a car manufacturer, you're probably getting that from somewhere else, so they have their own, own constraints. And so um, the majority of, of car manufacturers are going to get their materials from a few locations. And so there's all these different, different fun constraints. So, um, but it's good to understand what our data look like. All right. Awesome. So, that's part one, just kind of getting a, a sense of our data using the histogram. Um, 
highly encourage you to do it to do this for pretty much any type of data set that you're looking at. You basically want to get some understanding of it. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of data analysis now. So one of the types of data analysis that we might want to do is understand whether or not there's a correlation between two different events in our data set. So um, we can go back over to our, our data and take a look at um, a couple things. And we're going to choose something that I think should have a correlation. So of our data that we have here, well, we've got things like um, horsepower and engine size. OK, so um, that makes sense that there's, there's probably a correlation between those, those two things. So a, what, a, what does a correlation mean? So a correlation means that as you go up in one thing, you go up in the other thing. Or if you go down in one thing, you go down in the other thing. And so one event is correlated with the other one. Um, right, and so I think many of you have heard this kind of term, correlation does not necessarily imply causation. So there's definitely, um, it's a trend, not a causal relationship. So A goes up, B goes up, um, sort of event. Why? Who knows um, at this point. So, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. And so how we would do this is we would generate a scatter plot. And so um, again, a lot of these tools are really common. And so Excel pretty much has them all set up for us. And so we can just go over to um, insert. And then, hey, look, there's a whole bunch of recommended charts. <laughs> wow. All right, so scatter plot, x, y scatter. Great. Let's just go ahead and click on that. And there's a scatter plot. Fantastic. And we get this nice little chart that's already pre-made for us. Um, we want to change our data, so we're going to click on this thing that says select data up here. So just hit select data. And we can just choose what we want to put in. So things that we want to put in, we said we wanted to go with engine size and horsepower. So let's figure out where engine size is. Where did I put engine size? Engine size, here we go, Q. Great. And then horsepower. And so um, Excel will just basically, you click on the column type, and if it's in this table format, it knows that it'll get rid of the header for us. Um, let's just subtract a bunch of these things. So there we go, perfect. And um, hit OK. See what it looks like. All right, so now we have this, this chart of different, whoops. Come here. Sorry, I meant to grab the thing and make it bigger. Um, Of that. All right, so now we have all of our data points sitting here um, on this nice chart. So on this, the y-axis, um, we have engine size, and then in the x-axis, we have horsepower. All right, so let's take a, a look at this and think about what it means. So it looks like there's this general trend that's kind of going upwards, right? So our, our dots have some sort of, of potential trend. So how would we actually look at that? So basically what we want to do if we're trying to correlate, look at correlation between data and between two different axes is we just want to say, hey, what's the, the best fit line for this is a, a really common way to do that. And so again, this is kind of a pre-built strategy. So if you just right click or control click onto um, one of the dots, doesn't matter which one, it'll ask you, hey, what do you want to do with this thing? Well, you can label it or whatever, but all we want to do is add a trend line. All right, great. So um, Excel already knows how to do this. You can dictate what type of trend line that you want to use. Um, linear is a good starting point, but you could play around and try to do a polynomial fit and see if it fits best. Um, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, but as you understand what those different trend lines mean um, or why you might want to use them, for example, you might want to use a logarithmic trend line if you think that there's some sort of event that's kind of going to cause some sort of asymptotic relationship. So basically, as you go up in one structure, um, the, if you go up in A, eventually B is no longer going to increase, but it's still going to correlate along this line. So, um, so no matter how big you get, get the engine, your horsepower is not going to go up or, or vice versa. So, or. All right, so we've got this, this trend line. And then what we want to do is we want to ask it to, to display a couple of things. So displaying the equation as well as the R squared value. So the R squared value is basically how well does this thing correlate? So how much do these plots or these dots scatter from this line? 
um, if something every time you went up in one in type A and it went up always went up exactly one in type B, you'd have a perfect correlation. So every single line would lie on that dot, right? Um, or every dot would lie on that line. Sorry, um, but most things don't have a distribution that's perfectly correlated. Um, so here we have a correlation and. Um, it tells, as I said, a value of one means that it's it's perfectly correlated. Um, a value of zero means it's un uncorrelated. All right. We also have a slope, and so the slope of our line is positive. So remember, lines have slopes, and lines have this equation m x plus b. So where m is the slope of the line, um, and b is the y intercept. So the slope of that line is basically going to tell us whether or not the correlation is positive or negative. So you could have a, a slope that was like every time you went up one in A, you went down one in B, right? So that'd be a slope of, of, of a negative slope. So, all right, so awesome. So this is another, another piece of data analysis. So if you were a car manufacturer and you're like, okay, so we really wanna build a, a car that has, a 300, has 300 horsepower um, and we're trying to figure out, you know, how much material we're gonna need and, and kind of what type of engine we, we're gonna need. Um, one might build this, this type of, of um, data and look at what cars are already out there and say, all right, so we're going to probably be estimating something in the range of 200 to 300, um, or I guess we look at the line here. So here's 300 horsepower and somewhere around the 245 ish range. So, so we could plug it into our equation and actually figure out the exact value if we wanted to. All right, so that's the value of trend lines. Um, again, a super common um, application and one of the cool things about trend lines, it's, it's a really common like first machine learning strategy. So basically, one way to machine learn stuff is basically do all these calculations. So you calculate a line and be like, okay, so how far is this dot from that line? How far is this dot from this line? How far is that dot from the line, et cetera. And so um, you can throw that into a computer program and you just start drawing lines. And so you draw your first line straight across and then be like, oh, these dots are really far away from it on average. And then you start to just change your, your line around, um, just doing this kind of, hypothesis iteration sort of strategy until you have a best fit. Um, so, so it's something to kind of think about and think about like using the, this understanding of, of what these trend lines work or how these work to kind of get yourself kind of this core basic into some of the machine learning structures that you're, you're going to maybe want to dig into later as you, as you become more of an experienced data scientist. All right, cool. So there's two, two different techniques that we've looked at. Um, the last thing I want to do is I want to run a t-test. And so, what is a t-test? And a lot of people kind of get um, lost on t-tests. So, um, I'm not going to go too far into it, um, but basically it's a way to compare averages between two different, different sample sets. And, um, you know, depending on how your data are distributed, if they're normal, you might want to use a student t-test or you might use a Welch's t-test or these different structures. Um, depending on what your data look like to kind of figure out whether or not two data sets are actually the same type of thing or if they're two separate types of things is a really common use. And so um, maybe we want to go ahead and, and take some data and look at number of car doors and, I don't know, wheel length, you know, uh, wheelbase length. So, um, and our, our null hypothesis in this case is going to be something to the effect of, hey, it doesn't matter how many car doors you have because wheelbase or wheel length is going to be not correlated with it, so um, they could both be from the same data set. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at that and see how we would attack that um, using Excel. So I'm just going to delete this guy now that we know our scatter plot. All right, so how I'm going to do this, I'm just going to, we already sorted this by um, number of doors, and so let's just go ahead and grab our wheelbase and go all the way down till we get to four doors. And we're in. Cool. Great. So I'm just going to move this over into another column. Great. So there's wheelbase. We're going to just name this part wheelbase, and we'll call it um, wheelbase two door. Great. And then I'm going to grab the four door variant. So just going back over. All right, wheelbase, and it was 90-ish. Cool. 
All right. Go down, grab all these guys. Oops, come on, scroll. Mm. Lots of four-wheeled, four-door cars. And there's a couple cars that have questionable numbers of doors. Um, I'm going to go with their Jeeps, but I actually don't know. <laughs> um, oh, a Dodge and a Mazda. Why don't they know how many doors they have? Doesn't make sense, but whatever. All right. <clears throat> So we'll just go ahead and move that over there. We'll call this one wheelbase four door. All right, great. So now we have two data sets that we want to compare whether or not they're the same or different. Um, so our null hypothesis is that it doesn't matter how many doors that we have um, are that they are going to fit and look the same. And so um, let's go ahead and do this. So now we're just going to go over to data. Again, go to our data analysis, um, hunt down. So <clears throat> um, we're going to say, hey, our assumption is that we're going to make have a t-test, and we're going to assume unequal variances. Great. All right. And just so you guys know, I'm, I'm going to do something a little bit. This whole part is a little bit duplicitous. Um, so just be aware that something else is going to happen at the end of this. All right. Cool. So variable range one and variable range two. Great. All right. So we can hypothesize that there's going to be some difference between the two of them to start with. Um, right now, we're going to our hypothesis is that they're exactly the same. All right. And then um, let's just run it. So we're going to create it as a new worksheet. Cool. All right. So we get this data back, and what this data looks like is it tells us the means of the two variables. So the two-door sample um, has a mean of 95. The one-door or the four-door sample has a mean of 101. And also, how many samples are in each group? So there's 89 samples and 114 samples in the two different groups. And once you start to get bigger sample sizes, again, it's easier to kind of look at the means. So the more samples you have, the more tendency there is to kind of go to what they're supposed to be. Um, and so if you had a million samples or an infinite number of samples, the mean would be whatever the population is, right? Um, so if you sample, looked at everything in the population, you would know exactly whether or not um, that thing is the mean or not. Um, but right now we're taking a subpopulation, so a sample from that population saying, oh, this could be the mean or this couldn't be the mean. Um, so we kind of want to know how many observations there are. So we get this, these values down here. So these values are these p-tests. So these p-tests are these p-values are basically the probability that these two things are the same. Um, and notice that they're 10 to the negative 12th um, ranges. And so what that's basically telling us is that there's a really, really small chance that if you just grabbed two random sample or two random groups um, of the same type of object, that you'd end up with these distributions. All right. Um, now, why? Um, so that's really cool. It's, it's a super useful tool. T-tests are great. Um, definitely take some time, play around with some different t-tests, read up about them um, when, you, when you're done with this video. But what I did that was duplicitous here is we didn't look at the histogram of these things. And the way t-tests are implemented on Excel are they're based on these student t-tests. And they need normal distributions. And so we don't know that these things were normal distributions before we actually attacked it. And in fact, we have some evidence that car manufacturing is not normal. Um, and so this is kind of the example of, of knowing the tools that you're using and jumping in and, and really addressing some of these really um, you know, interesting problems is really fun. So go ahead and jump into machine learning. But don't forget to, to really emphasize the basics so you don't make a pitfall and make a mistake like I just did, where you're saying, hey, this is what these analyses tell us, when that's not really what these analyses tell us. So um, hopefully that was all helpful. And with that, um, we're really excited to have you have had you join us for this program. And hopefully you'll stick with us through Power BI and then integrating R with Power BI. But if not, there are some really excellent tools out there to kind of expand your data science horizons. Um, kind of in a, in a structured format where you're learning, you know, the statistical core going through and learning how to program in Python. Um, 
learning how to program in R and then applying machine learning strategies from that point. Because um, the goal of this is really to kind of give you the overview of what data science is. So hopefully you enjoyed it, and uh, I definitely enjoyed having you here. <laughs>